Ladies and gentlemen, SIOP President, Dr. Steve Kozlowski. Uh, so I can, do I have a live mic here? So I think we can declare victory now, right? So uh, I don't know, it's been a fantastic conference, uh, at least for me, but I, what do you think? I mean, the sessions were spectacular, too many things to go to, I uh, had a lot of conflicts there, special activities, networking, everything, unbelievably fantastic. So, you know, during the last year, I really wanted to enhance the reach and impact of SIOP. The theme track on Thursday focused on doing that by encouraging uh, and enabling initiatives that make that impact happen from the bottom up. I've heard so much buzz about the theme track activities from people, so it really got a lot of folks excited. <laughs> Really hoping to see that get some stickiness and to snowball a bit. So I'm sure Zach will be following up on that next year to see how we've been doing. Uh, so I'm really interested in getting that emergent, self-organizing, powerful aspect of PSYOP moving forward. And we want to make it sticky. So I'm really encouraged by the response and the buzz that we've been hearing in our effort to have an impact and make a difference that continues well into the future. So I want to thank the uh, presenters and the volunteers who helped make this conference such a fantastic success. Special thanks go to members of the program committee and conference committee. I especially want to uh, thank program chair Scott Ponydale. <laughs> well, what a great program. Conference chair Enin King and the members of the administrative office who helped the conference and the society run so smoothly. I mean, you may have heard some of the thumping and pounding yesterday afternoon if you were attending sessions, and that didn't happen today because we were on it. <laughs> yeah, you could clap. <laughs> so, Eden and Scott, please come forward. A small token. And now, to introduce our keynote speaker, here is Eden. Eden, thanks go to you and your team for an, an I mean, it's an excellent job. I'm reading the script, but it's a fantastic job. This is such an amazing conference. You did such a fantastic job. I'm not a floating head anymore. It is my distinct privilege to introduce Laszlo Bach, who leads Google's people function and is responsible for attracting, developing, re retaining, and delighting Googlers. During Bach's tenure, Google has been named the best company to work for more than 30 times around the world and received over 100 awards as an employer of choice. You can get a sense of why he was named Human Resources Executive of the Year in 2010 from his book, Work Rules, and from the Rework website. But I was personally, genuinely moved when I heard him speak. Laszlo inspired a room filled, like this one, with leaders from industry and academe with an exciting challenge. He said, let's quietly conspire to make work better everywhere. I am so very delighted that he agreed to talk with us today and that he will share his ideas about how to fulfill this remarkable goal. Join me in welcoming Laszlo Bach. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Wow. Um, no pressure. Uh, how's everyone doing? No better way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Um, for those who end up seeing this recording, uh, I can't believe 50,000 people showed up for this <laughs> conference and this event. Um, I also had no idea that PSYOP had so many amazing cheerleaders and gymnasts. <laughs> really impressive how inclusive you are. What a wide net you cast. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, it's a little daunting um, because I have probably fewer degrees than almost any of you. And, uh, and probably I'm not as good at math as any of you, so um, please be kind. 
Uh, the title of this talk is Hello HR Meets Science. And the reason we have that title is because there's a Googler named Jennifer Kurkowski who leads our People Innovation Lab. And our People Innovation Lab started uh, in 2007 or so, 2007, 2008, where we said, what if we at Google actually brought in some academics as partners? What we'd been doing until then is just hiring them as employees. But we realized not everybody actually wants to stop being an academic and be a practitioner. So we brought some folks in, had sort of our founding cohort. And then a couple years after that, Jennifer posted a blog entry which said, hello, HR, meet science. And her point was, there's a huge opportunity to make the way we treat people and think about people better by applying some actual science and facts and reasoning, exactly what all of you have been doing for decades. So I want to start by giving a little context about kind of how I came to this field and, and my interest in it. And um, it goes back to uh, when I was a kid, uh, 9, 10, 11 years old, and I went to my public library and I found this book. Actually, I wasn't sure if it'd be okay to show this. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a very moment in time kind of book. Um, and you can probably guess what attracted me to this book. Um, it was actually not the salacious uh, misogynistic cover, uh, but instead, instead, it was the fact that it talked all about body language. And as a kid, to have my mind expanded by this notion that there's all this nonverbal stuff going on that most people aren't aware of, but is incredibly important for how we connect, how we relate to each other. There's this entire layer of stuff going on in our brains and between us. And not only is it a real thing, but you can actually, once you're aware of it, manipulate it, not for evil purposes, but to actually build rapport and build friendships if you mirror someone's body language. As an 11-year-old, this was like, as an 11-year-old nerd, um, <laughs> this was mind-blowing. It was amazing. And then years later in graduate school, um, when I was getting my MBA, I took a class called Advanced Multivariate Statistics. And, um, and there was a study we, I read, this was in the late 90s, and the study was written in the early 90s, and it was about doctors making decisions. And it said doctors left to their own devices make pretty good decisions when it comes to making a diagnosis. But you can generate an algorithm which says, okay, you know, does the patient have a fever or not, and does the patient have a stomach or a headache or what have you? You can generate a heuristic which actually also makes a pretty good diagnosis. But when you put them together, you actually make a better diagnosis than either by themselves. And this underlying principle is something we live by at Google and something we've incorporated into everything we do. That all people decisions should be made with data and analytics, but also with a human element. A sense of where's the judgment? What's actually going on? And we should try to marry these things, not replace one with another, but complement one with another. Clicker really likes this slide. There we go. Um, and it's interesting because we started down this path a while ago. You've all been doing this for a long time. I'll talk in a for a moment in a second about the history. But there's this kind of cool thing happening in the popular culture right now where everybody is actually really, really interested in the work that all of you are doing. And you see this in all the headlines about how we should be interviewing. You see it in the debates about performance management, which are not in some obscure academic journal but are in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, in Time Magazine, which is everywhere. You see it in the, the, all the literature, all the books published about motivation, Dan Pink's drive, all these things. People are hungry for the work you are all doing and to understand what it means. And those of you who are academics are sort of finding truth, and those of you who are practitioners are actually making it happen in the real world. There's appetite for that in a way that has not existed in the past. Businesses are paying attention, too. There's a ton of startups in this space, and they're doing very cool things. There's been something like a billion dollars of venture capital invested in companies that focus on IO psych and that use IO psych to actually make decisions, whether it comes to hiring, whether it comes to cultural assessment, whether it comes to performance management, whether it comes to goal setting. This is a really real thing. And these companies are really valuable because they're doing something that's important and that people by themselves don't do well. Because one of the challenges of the work we all do is because we're all human beings and we all hire and make management decisions and discriminate, we all think we're experts because we've had that experience. And our judgment, our intuition, all that stuff that feels right is sometimes wrong and sometimes very badly wrong. And there's moments like now where people are hungry for that knowledge. So this is an amazing time. And the last couple days here have been mind-blowing because I've listened to so many of you talk about the incredibly cool things you're doing to advance the science of how we actually understand the human condition. So we're getting more analytical in 
everything we do in every kind of business. And if you trace the history, I know all of you actually know almost all of this history, but right, you had who in the early 1900s talking about automation efficiency? Who? Okay, uh, only three people. Okay, yes, yeah, so the correct answer was was Taylor. Uh, thank you to the these folks. Resty, I don't know. Um, I hope no one's getting graded on this. But, but as I understand it, it was Frederick Winslow Taylor who actually pioneered a bunch of this stuff. Then after World War II, you had Deming and Duran and people like that popularizing that. So they went from how factories work to how do you improve operations. Then in the 80s, you saw a transition from Mad Men kind of advertising to the professionalization, the bringing of data and analysis and insight to how advertising works. Time Inc., actually, their greatest asset in the 80s and early 90s was not Time Magazine or Life Magazine. It was their customer database. They had a tremendous amount of information about every one of their subscribers, because people would fill in the little cards, and then they would use that to send ads to you and resell that data. I mean, they were, in a sense, if you think about the data they had and the ad targeting, they were the Facebook of their day. They were the Google of the day. They were the people who really understood this better than anybody else at the time. And now what's happening is the people space is going through that same data revolution. So if you go on Google Trends, where you can search for any term, that people are looking for on the internet and how often it shows up and look for the phrase people analytics. What you see is in around 2008, it showed up. It wasn't really there before. It wasn't a thing, but it became one. And it reflects an opportunity all of us have to make work better, to make work different everywhere around the world. So I want to walk you through kind of how we do this at Google and give you a couple of tangible examples uh, to anchor on. Um, and then share a little bit about how we're thinking about things going forward, and then we'll have Q&A, and we can talk about anything you all wish. Um, when I joined Google in 2006, um, there was already an HR team in place. They were doing great work. We actually had uh, what would eventually become the people analytics team, because we had a compensation analyst, and a staffing analyst, and a benefits analyst. And they didn't work together. And we put them all together in one team and they initially said, oh, I don't want to work in this other area because I focus on staffing issues and that's my expertise. And I focus on benefits issues and that's my expertise. They actually resisted this because the disciplines were different. And those of you in academia, does this sound familiar? And for those of you who are practitioners, does it sound kind of weird because you're like, what's the difference? So we pulled them together and started doing this stuff. And it was amazing because what was happening in the company was we wanted to bring more rigor, more science, more thoughtfulness to how we made people decisions. And Google had been very successful up until that time. We had, I think, around 6,000 employees at that time. Company had done great, had an IPO, things were going fantastic. We thought we could do better. And we'd go to the engineers and say, hey, you know what, if you think about hiring, rather than looking at uh, where somebody went to school, why don't you look at these other factors which actually predict performance? And they said, we don't believe your science. We said, what do you mean? Here's our science. Look, we've got like a .35 R squared that says this factor predicts who you should hire. And our computer scientists said, that's a terrible R squared. <laughs> that's garbage. Now, if it were a .997 R squared, we might have an interesting conversation. <laughs> because you see, we train on billions of data points. We back up the internet. And that's the kind of rigor we're looking for. And we were like, oh man, that's going to be hard to get to. So what we did was we shared the data with them. And we said, OK, you guys are brilliant. And it was mostly guys. We said, you guys are brilliant. Here's the data set. We gave a set of our engineers all our employee compensation data. And this was super sensitive. Because remember, if you had been at Google pre-IPO, you could have made a million bucks. You could have made 20 million bucks. There were people who made $100 million. And if you joined two days after the IPO, you were making $100,000 a year at best, right? Um, and so there was a lot of sensitivity in this data. And we anonymized it. And we gave it to this group of engineers and said, how would you design our compensation system? And our compensation team and our analysts had a thesis for, here's what it should look like. And the engineers came up with something. We partnered with them. And the engineers came up with something with our help that was about 80, 85% of what we wanted to do. And we were like, that's awesome. Let's do it. So we sacrificed getting to what we thought was the perfect answer for they're bought in, they're engaged. And in fact, when later, when we rolled out our stuff, our comp systems, and Googlers would ask, uh, we call our employees Googlers. Uh, sorry, by the way. Uh, so we're all Googlers. A new Googler is a Noogler. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we have affinity groups. Uh, the, we have the Gaglers. Uh, the ones, <laughs> ones for people who are older are Greglers. Uh, it's all very clever. Um, 
But we sacrificed perfection for getting them engaged. And when people would ask questions, my team, the people operations team, didn't answer the questions. The engineers who worked on this would weigh in on the email threads and aliases and talk about, here's what actually happened. And an interesting thing happened. <laughs> After about seven years of partnering with the engineers and iterating with them, the answer we're now at is really, really close to the answer that the compensation team thought we should do in the first place. And in between, was it a little suboptimal? Yeah. Was it the best outcome? Absolutely. So that's what we've tried to do throughout. I want to walk you through three kind of case studies. Um, because some of the work we do is de novo, original, never before seen. But a lot of it is, as Newton said, uh, we can see far because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And you are those giants. We take established principles that have been proven in the literature. And whenever we're faced with a human problem, we often go and do an academic lit review as a starting point and then say, OK, given that, what should we do? So here's a, oh, oh yeah, this is how serious we are. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I may have forgotten that was in there. <laughs> but it's, so what we did, I was, I was in a comic book store and they had these stickers, and, um, and they did not come with the little gold stars. Uh, that was an aftermarket edition. And I thought they were so cool, I came and gave them to members of the team. And our head of people analytics, uh, Prasad Sethi, himself thought they were so cool. So he actually had them made and given to everyone on his team, the people analytics team. So they've all got them. It's like standard issue. But this is actually his laptop. So <laughs> when he goes to a meeting with like our executive team <laughs> or our board of directors, he sits down, opens the laptop. There it is. <laughs> and what's cool is. Uh, one of the things that's cool about it is it's totally legit. Nobody gives him a hard time about it. He and the team have credibility. Every person on that team is trusted. And we got there over time. But they know, they get the joke, but they know this is because we can back up our assertions with science, with data that's credible, reliable, predictive. That's good stuff. That is truth. That is veritas. That is honesty. And that matters. That matters a lot. So what's a known truth that everybody in this room knows about? Social dynamics and work design, they matter to teams. Anyone want to take the other side of that argument? Nobody? OK. What? What's, no? OK. So we asked, OK, well, in the Google context, what makes an effective team? Because one of the things we'd learned, going back to this lesson about the compensation stuff, is that we actually have way more credibility and impact if we train on our own data. Now, there's issues with sample bias and selection and things like that that we need to address. Uh, but, and we do address as to the best of our ability. Um, and we caveat our Google work by always saying, anytime we make it public, we always say, but this is the Google stuff. Your mileage may vary. It may not work in your environment. But this is our experience. It actually works for us. And if it's helpful, here you go. So we did a thing called Project Oxygen. Project Oxygen was about, do managers matter? And we found, indeed, they do. And some of the things that make managers effective at Google are pretty boring stuff. Having regular one-on-ones, being a good coach, setting clear direction. Super boring stuff that has existed in the literature for decades. But when we told our Googlers, we did this study of our own employees, and here's the outcome, they accepted it. And it was really, really powerful. So we did a similar thing with Teams. We did a two-year study looking at Teams, went through a bunch of different iterations. And here's what we found makes an effective team at Google. Any shocking surprises here? Anybody knocked off their seat? So we did find some things which are surprising. Um, for example, team composition doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Take a team of high performers, take a team of low performers, take a team of mixed performers. Doesn't really predict whether that team's going to perform. If you put these factors in place, it matters. We also learned that it's really important not just to do the diagnosis and tell the team, hey, we've discovered you're really unsafe psychologically. <laughs> you actually have to know then how to address it and fix it and turn it into action. We also found some really interesting interaction effects. So for example, dependability matters and clarity, role clarity matters for a high performing team. You've got to have both. But if you want to be an ultra high performing team, you actually have to decrease the amount of role clarity. Because what we have, and, and once, we saw the, once I saw the analysis, I was like, oh my god, this is actually how we've been working on our management team. 
You need role clarity and dependability so people like get used to working with one another, know what everyone's doing. But then you actually, to really transcend that, you need less role clarity because what you don't want is the finance person to only say, eh, if it's not a finance problem, it's not my problem. You don't want the person running Android to say, well, you know, that's a sales issue or that's a Google search issue. It doesn't affect Android. You want those boundaries to blur. It's been powerful, but rooted in your work, all of your work. Another example. We know, we meaning you, I didn't know this, um, the new higher onboarding programs lead to better productivity, right? Everyone agree? Yes? So, question, how can we help our Nooglers, everyone knows what Nuglers is by now? How can we help our Nooglers ramp up more quickly? And what can we learn from the existing literature? Um, and we partnered with uh, Talia Bauer from Portland State University and did some really cool work in this stuff. And here's the shocker. We gave a checklist to our new hires and their managers. And the checklist was super mundane for the most part. So we told Nooglers things like be proactive, which is not, first of all, I like hate the word proactive. Like it was, um, it pains me to confess that we actually use the word proactive because it's jargony, buzzwordy thing, doesn't mean anything. But fortunately, it's followed by a couple paragraphs which says, what this means is reach out to people if you have a question, ignore title, feel like you can just get things done, ask forgiveness, not permission. We explain that. And we tell the manager some simple things too, like for example, make sure you introduce your new hire to at least two people. Because it turns out, as you know from the literature, and as we saw in our experiments, that there's a moment when you can form social networks readily and easily, and the earlier you do that, the better and the easier it is to have them form. And when we encourage that to happen by having the manager give that nudge, that small intervention that Thaler and Sunstein write about, it has a huge impact, a disproportionate impact. We also tell managers, make sure your new employee has a computer that works. Because <laughs> it turns out that also is a huge derailer in terms of your experience of your first few days at a company. Not because you stay ticked off forever, but because in that vital moment where you're sort of striving for social cohesion, where you're trying to figure out what the norms are and where you fit in, when you're deciding how you're gonna conduct yourself, what aspect of your persona you're gonna present and inhabit in this environment, if you spend two days working with IT, you don't have the luxury of doing that. You're already behind the eight ball. So the effect of this was a 25% improvement in the time to productivity, time to full productivity at Google, 25% by sending a couple emails, and that was it. So the big insights, we love our little nudges, and they have disproportionate impact. When you intervene matters a lot, and the effect is huge. At our rate of hiring, that's the equivalent of 200 free employees a year. Free, because we send two emails. And the other beautiful thing is, for those of you who are on the practitioner side, the people operations team doesn't have to do extra work. Once we figured this out, emails are automatic. And that saves time for us, and we can focus on other things. What other things? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I've not mastered the clicker. We know that intrinsic motivation is stronger and more rewarding than extrinsic motivation, in general. There's exceptions, but this is like Desi and Ryan and all the other work, right? Intrinsic, good. Extrinsic, mm, hit and miss. Fair? More or less? This one's a little, not as you know. This is a little more complicated. So here's our question. How can we keep people at Google thinking like owners and not employees? How can we keep them motivated by intrinsic factors? When the company had 50 people, it was easy because everyone was an owner. You all got options. And you didn't know what they were going to be worth, but there were just 50 of you. You like felt like it was your place. And that was true when we had 200 people and 500 people. By the time I joined, we had 6,000 people. We were two years post the IPO. We still give everybody stock in the company. Every single employee we hire gets stock. And every single employee is eligible and the proportion of people who get stock is incredibly high. Most companies, when they get to our size, they decide we're only gonna give it to the executives or we're just gonna give de minimis grants that we peanut butter. We give big grants all over the place. But we do a bunch of things where we encourage Googlers and allow them to do things without paying. And it's not to save money. And Googlers will come to us and managers will come to us and say, can I get credit in, in the performance management system for these activities? Can I get a spot bonus for doing this? Can I get a little bump here? Can I get some recognition? And we consistently say no because we don't want to remove the intrinsic motivation for what people are doing. For example, we have a program called Googler to Googler. 
That means Googlers are teaching one another classes. Last year, 5,000 Googlers, out of our current population of 62,000, 5,000 taught classes to other Googlers. And in fact, 80% of our internal training content was delivered by people in Googler to Googler. And I had an option where, in people operations, I could hire hundreds and hundreds of trainers and hire consultants and hire professional training people to come in. Any of those in the room? Because <laughs> I love you. Um, but it turns out stuff's better when your own people teach it, because they're like living it. And they're not teaching all work stuff. Yeah, there's computer science courses they're teaching, but they're also teaching history of the bicycle, uh, wine appreciation. Um, I just learned actually this week, there's a course on, uh, it's something like, um, I don't know the exact name, but, but it's taught by someone who's a mediator for people who are about to get married to how to think about your financial assets before you even get married. But it's kind of like a smart time to think about it, uh, <laughs> I'm told. Uh, so on our team in people operations, we didn't hire a bunch of trainers. We have some, but we hired instructional designers. And before you can teach a Googler to Googler course, the instructional designer works with you. And whether it's a one hour course that you offer once a year or a two day course, they work with you, they refine it, they get the teaching methodology right, they make sure there's measurable outcomes, then you go teach the course. It actually saves us money. But we do not give performance credit for it, and we do not give bonuses for it, and we do not give anything special for it, even though it kind of feels like we should because we want that intrinsic motivation to persist. Similarly, every company has employee resource groups, affinity groups, things like that. And this is actually, this is a really big debate we have because we talk a lot about diversity in our business, a lot about unconscious bias around respect, around inclusion. Um, and there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time on these things and there's an argument that says you should pay for that time because it takes away from the job. And there's recent research, actually, I heard about it today too, uh, that says actually if you're a member of a diverse group and you're spending time on this, you're doubly penalized versus if you're a member of a, you know, somebody who's in a majority group. Um, so it kind of sucks. It's a huge tax to be paid. We don't do anything extra for it. And the reason is we want not just the people who are diverse to feel like it's their company and they own it. We want everyone else to be brought along. So we have a women at Google group, and there's plenty of men in it. Our Gagler group, there's plenty of people who are not LGBTQ in that group, right? And part of the reason is because the company belongs to all of these people. So I'll give you an example. One of the things we're experimenting with is using uh, virtual reality to instill empathy in people. So there's really cool neuroscience uh, behind this, but uh, the experience of virtual reality is so all-encompassing that it sort of, you know, shortcuts behind a lot of your, your cognitive defenses, really. And our thesis is it's really hard to teach somebody that, you know, they need to love their neighbor. Um, that's been tried for thousands and thousands of years with pretty good success, but not everywhere. Um, it might be easier just to short circuit that and help people be more empathetic. So we did a pilot where we had 100 people get together, Google employees, put on the headsets, put on the earphones, immerse themselves in this experience. But to do that, there were 25 other people actually managing the simulation. And by that I mean, is your headphone on right? Are the goggles on right? Is it in focus? Is it playing? Is it correct? Because you, know, you need somebody standing right there to be able to make sure it works. Otherwise, you're like burst out of the simulation right away. And those 25 people who showed up to do this were Googlers in sales and marketing and finance and engineering and a couple from people operations, Googlers from every part of the company who just said, I'm going to spend some time on this. Now, we cheat a little bit because we probably have slightly more employees than we need which gives us a little bit of buffer, but there's not science behind that. That's just my gut. But we want people to feel ownership. We want people to be intrinsically motivated to do things. And when they do get rewarded, it's from their peers. It's not from management. And that's far more powerful than anything else we could do. So what we've been trying to do over the last couple years, too, is, um, is expand the, the reach of kind of the, the stuff we're doing and use our brand as a platform that others can benefit from. I believe that there's a revolution that we're living through in terms of how business works, in terms of how society works, and that all of you who are members of PSYOP are uniquely positioned to have tremendous impact on some of the most important issues our society is facing today. So since at Google we all get 20% time, one of the things I get to do in 20% time is sponsor this thing. So this is called Rework. Uh, it's just a platform. It's a website. Search it. And we're trying to look for examples of really cool work done that's proven and replicable and share that with lots of people. So if you go on here, you'll find the Google Unconscious Bias Training Kit. 
all our materials online. Go ahead, use them. God bless you, enjoy them. Uh, we found they had a really powerful impact on our company. We're hearing good feedback. Um, if you want to get better at hiring, we've got kits about how to do recruiting and how to do it in a more thoughtful, scientific way. Not that any of you do, because you're here, you know what you're doing. But all those other unwashed, dirty people out there who, you know, <laughs> hire based on their guts and, you know, what have you. But there's cool stuff that all of you actually are doing. Um, Andy Biga is here from, from JetBlue. And I didn't actually know he was going to be here. I didn't meet him. But one of the things we've highlighted is uh, JetBlue has done some really cool work on their reservation agents, trying to figure out how to make them stay. Reservation agents, high turnover rate. And so they did a job assessment. They asked managers what's actually important in the job. They asked the employees what's important in the job. They put all that together, did a bunch of math, and they came out with some things that they started screening for versus the process they had before. They reduced attrition by 50%. And what's beautiful is I don't need to explain the R squared to engineers on that because I can just say we have way more people than we used to. <laughs> like they're, they're still here. That's my R squared. Um, and it works. And so we're trying to draw attention to this. And so take a look. If it's helpful, great. If not, feel free to ignore it. There's no money changing hands. It's just something we think is like the right thing to do. And the reason we think it's the right thing to do is all of you, and me to an extent, and us at Google, but all of you have a much bigger footprint than we do at Google. And think about the impact we could have if our society, if everywhere in the world people thought about problems, our big social problems, in the way you all do. The gender pay gap that's in the press like crazy. Equal pay day was a couple days ago. Um, what if everyone in society who was hiring women had an understanding of what anchoring bias was when they hired and when they evaluated prior salary and made a decision about what salary to offer in that job. I think a bunch of the wage gap would go away. There's been a huge national discussion about race the last couple years. Starting, you know, actually, I don't know what the right starting point is. You can go back hundreds of years. Um, I remember when Trayvon Martin was shot, we had, a, uh, we had at our company All Hands, we had a protest. We had a hoodie march. We had, I mean, people were fired up about it. And you know, it's a fraction of what people have seen and felt in society. Um, there's a real serious national conversation going on about this. And yet most people, if you talk to them, will not admit to being racist, sexist, homophobic, what have you, right? It's just their worldview. It's really hard to change those kind of things. But what if everyone in America understood unconscious bias in the way that Eden was talking about in her presentation this afternoon, when she showed slides showing that a woman and a woman wearing an obesity prosthesis were treated completely differently in interviews, that a woman in Western clothes and a woman in a hijab were treated completely differently, not in obvious, oh, you know, I hate somebody in a headscarf, but small measures like frowning, tightening of facial muscles, a different tone, a different attitude, those tiny pernicious things that add up and make it so much harder in this society to be anything except a white male who's straight. What if everyone understood that? You wouldn't have to win their hearts and minds. You just have to make them aware. And there's academic research which shows that that moment of thinking, that moment of reflection, that moment of awareness, that's all you need because the behavior changes after that. Now I'm grossly simplifying this one because race is a much bigger, deeper, deeper question. Um, one of the most persuasive writers on this is ta Easy Coates. Worth reading his stuff. It is powerful. It is true. But imagine. If across this country people understood unconscious bias, how different it would be for everybody. Imagine what education would be like in this country if people understood Dweck's work on growth mindset. Or people understood Chris Argyris' work on learning from failure. Chris Argyris isn't well known. He was a Harvard professor. He, he asked the question, why do HBS students plateau in their careers 10 years out? And it's because successful people don't fail that often. And if you go to HBS, you've been successful all along the way. So when they hit failure, their ability to learn shuts down. But then you've got charter schools, which are doing things like saying, hey, kid, take a math test. And if you fail, take it again for half credit. They're teaching kids that failure is essential. That if you're only succeeding, you're going to shoot yourself down the line. It's going to be a problem for you. So imagine if our educational system was built around the idea of growth and around learning from failure. You wouldn't have tracking. You wouldn't have like six-year-old or 10-year-old kids being told you're in the slow math class, you're in the medium, you're in the fast math class, right? And adhering to those labels for the rest of their careers. You wouldn't have girls being told, 
oh, you know, that's really cute. You know, do you want to play with the dolls, um, but not with the computers, right? You wouldn't have dumb things like when the toys came out after the Star Wars movie, right? There was no female action figure. Like one of the two main characters is a woman. There's no female, or Scarlett Johansson, the Avengers movie, right? You buy all the action figures, there's no Scarlett Johansson. Crazy. Imagine how different our world could be if the knowledge that is in your heads and your organizations was understood by everybody. That would be a world worth living in. So I'll pause there, but this is the opportunity. This has been an amazing couple of days for me. I've never been to PSYOP before. It, I've learned a tremendous amount, met some amazing people. But this is my ask of you. You're all doing cool things in your schools, in your colleges, in your companies. There's much bigger stuff we can be tackling together. I hope we do. So with that, I'll open it up for questions, comments. Thanks. Thank you. So we've, we've got some mics set up up in the front here. Uh, one there, one here, and one here. There may be more. My experience in the discussions is that nobody ever has a question for the first few minutes, and it gets super awkward. Uh, <laughs> so I'm comfortable cold calling. I'll ask a question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I read your book. I thought it was awesome. Um, Thank you. That was great. I, was Thank I you, right sir. In <laughs> uh, this, <laughs> Uh, was, uh, it seems uh, you talk about the importance of cognitive ability, and uh, if I'm reading it right, you're, it looks like you're assessing mostly the structured interviews, is that mm -hmm. right? That is correct. Um, you know, since you're data and evidence driven, have you considered maybe uh, administering a classic cognitive ability test, maybe just experimentally in the beginning and seeing if it adds anything incrementally beyond your structured interviews? It's a great question. Uh, we're looking at it right now. Um, we, when we've looked at them in the past, what, part of the issue has been there's a lot of inbuilt gender bias and contextual bias around it. Like the SAT is a classic example, right? Purportedly, it measures cognitive ability and preparation for college. Um, and then, you know, the, I mean, that, that's kind of well documented. Um, so we're dabbling, uh, but we're not sure that there, we haven't yet found a reliable instrument. Um, we are looking at things that are very skill specific. So for example, um, the ability to code great, elegant software. Um, is something that seems to be a little more amenable to that kind of testing. Uh, so we're looking at it. We haven't found the right thing yet. We know that the way we're assessing it through structured interviews isn't perfect either. Um, so we're, if you have an idea, we'll take it. Um, we'll go here and then back to the lady. So after uh, three days of uh, listening to rigorous science, I need to ask a pop culture question. OK, awesome. Um, you've probably heard of the movie Internship. Yes. Does <laughs> that reflect any reality of what Google really is? Um, we, we do not play Quidditch. <laughs> um, the, there's some elements of it. Um, uh, we actually we have the yes-no paddles. Um, and uh, th there's, there's some truth to it. Um, I'm thinking of all the off-color things in the movie, which are not true. Um, I, I think. The elements that are, that are kind of, the, the big things that are not true. Um, there's not like a hazing ritual with internships. We actually want to hire everyone we can. And so our goal is to get everyone hired, if we possibly can, not to screen people out. Uh, we also, um, we take bets on a lot of people. There's a bunch of things we do to try to screen people in. Our hiring system is super conservative. We get 3 million applications a year. We hire about net 5,000 people. Um, so we have very few what we think are false positives. I think we have a lot of false negatives, so we're trying to figure out how to widen that aperture. Um, and in the movie, I'm not going to spoil the ending for anyone. Um, you know, the denouement at the end when it's like, oh, I was the one championing you even though I was the one hating you, you know, who you thought hated you. Like, that kind of stuff actually happens without the hate. Um, so there's, all, there's actually a lot of elements. Uh, we were not closely involved with the movie. Um, but you know, the good stuff is true, the bad stuff not so much, except for the Quidditch, which is not true. <laughs> thank you. Hi there. And so thank you for a very inspiring um, uh, speech this afternoon. Uh, certainly, you leave us with a very, you know, with, with a big challenge and a very inspiring one. 
Um, one of the thing, one of the issues that I think PSYOP has, you know, um, struggled with for many years is is sort of the question of visibility and impact. So how do you, how do we as a society, as a science, um, take what we know and you know and get it out there? Mm -hmm. And so you're you're essentially you know challenging us to do that. So I'm curious if you have any um, you know any ideas or any words of wisdom on how to actually accomplish mm -hmm. that challenge that you have given us today. Uh, I have words. I don't know if they're of wisdom. Um, I think if you're an academic, my advice would be publish your failure. Or if you can't publish it, just post it. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge out there that we just don't know about because the failures don't get published. And there's lots of reasons why that's true, right? Um, but then the science doesn't advance because everyone else is going down bad alleys. Uh, the second thing is, if you're on the practitioner side, tell your stories, right? It's funny, because at Google, we've, we've had the, we actually, we don't share that much. Like, we don't give earnings guidance. A whole bunch of stuff is confidential. Somebody actually asked me, you know, how many people do you have in people operations? And I said, oh, we don't share that. They're like, why don't you share that? And I'm like, well, I don't really know, um, <laughs> other than we don't share a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but we made a decision to take a bunch of the stuff that is truly competitive advantage Right? about how we hire and pay a performance manager and put it out there. And our rationale was, on the margins, we may lose some candidates. On the margins, there may be some people who go to other companies. And maybe five and 10 years out, every other company is going like, to have a lot of the elements we have. And we're far from perfect. We suck at a lot of stuff. Um, but maybe work will be better in lots of places because of some of the stuff we put out there, and we'll be at a disadvantage. Our calculus was, it's worth it. There's a greater good. And so I heard amazing things over the last couple of days about what all kinds of your companies and organizations are doing. And it's amazing that it was shared here. But there's huge demand in the popular culture to learn how this works and to have the stories of how people's lives were changed. Tell those stories. Uh, because other organizations will listen, and they will take your example and say, you know, here's what they did at Dow Chemical. Right? Or here's what they did at JetBlue. Or here's what they did at Wegmans. Let's try it over here. It's really powerful. So just share more. Yes. Hi. Uh, so over the last year, I actually designed a workshop on unconscious bias and have delivered it to our executive teams throughout Latin America and my company. And we found that creating that awareness has been extremely powerful. But sort of the feeling I'm left with when I leave those workshops is now what? So what mm -hmm. recommendations do you have to really anchor um, and remind people of their biases continuously and so they don't fall back into their routines and their habit? Well, first, um, it's awesome that you did that. That's super, super cool. Um, there's some environments which are more and less hospitable to that kind of stuff. So to do that in Latin America is, that's fantastic and courageous. Um, there's a couple things. Our experience, and again, this is just what we've done. So take it with a grain of salt, is that um, number one, we didn't need to get to everybody. So when we developed our unconscious bias program four years ago or so, um, we made it voluntary, and about half the company, a little more than half the company went through it. And we had this big debate about, should you force everyone to do it, should you not? What we found, and the analytics team hates when I use this metaphor, for reasons I don't understand, so I'll use it, um, <laughs> that it was a little like inoculating a herd. You don't need to actually like get to everybody. You just need to get to enough people that the mores change, right? Or I guess mores is how you say it. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of enough. The second thing, though, is we built it then into some of these pivotal moments that people have in their careers. So now, when you are a Noogler, part of your orientation is unconscious bias. Part of the new manager curriculum um, is unconscious bias. So we embed it in different points that people pass through in their careers. And because we grow a lot, we're getting a bunch of people through this every single year. And it's just part of kind of who we are and, and what we do. The other thing is, um, what we found is that it's been an evolution. and so. We started by talking about diversity. We talked about diversity for years and years and years. didn't make much traction. We started talking about unconscious bias. It had a big, measurable impact on the way the company works. Um, then we started talking about respect. Because the immediate next thing that happens is everyone's like, oh my god, I'm biased. I'm doing all these things. I see all these things. It's super awkward, right? Because what do you do and how do you have that conversation? So we developed a curriculum around and a whole bunch of different reporting mechanisms about respect and how to have these conversations. And now we're talking about inclusion in the company rather than diversity. And I was delighted to learn today that that's the correct thing to do um, <laughs> for a whole bunch of reasons. So part of it is get them at the different points. You don't have to get everybody. Um, and then you need to evolve the content so that people don't habituate and just go like, yeah, it's the same old thing. 
my two cents. Uh, sir, oh, was he? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your talk today, Laszlo. I um, have just started reading your book with our HR team at World Vision International and appreciate your conversation that you've started across the country about people and, and science. Thank you. Without getting into a debate about generational differences, I'm fascinated with the future of work. My baby boomer dad is coming up on 40 years of working with the same employer, and my millennial self is predicted, according to science and research, to have eight to 10 different careers mm. within my lifetime. What do you think, if you had to put your crystal ball out on the table, the future of work looks like in light of things like multi-careering, I teach on the side as well as my full-time job and love both. I want to be in the practical world, but also get my feet wet in academics. What do you think the future of work looks like? What do you think some of those challenges will be as well? Yeah. Have you experienced that at Google so far? Yeah. Um, if so, what, okay. what's going on there? Thanks. All right, so for, if the mic wasn't picking up, the very simple question is, what is the future of work and what's going to happen to everything and everyone when it comes to work? <laughs> is that fair? OK. Um, it's going to be all right. <laughs> I actually, so just 30 seconds. Um, I actually think, um, like in the probability cloud of what things will happen, I think there's a really good chance of, um, I, I think there's a couple things which will make a big difference. One is um, whether organizations, and you are all on the hook for this, are able to see past traditional pedigree and develop a new way of either assessing or credentialing people so they can assess people who don't have traditional benchmarks of success. If that happens, future of work is awesome. Um, second thing is, uh, I think for many, many years, like for decades, probably centuries, if you, depending what country you look at, you're going to be able to make a bunch of money as a corporation, as an institution, treating people super good, super good, super well, um, and by treating them really badly. Because there's a lot of people who need to work. And they got to make that money, and they need to find a way to do it. And companies can like hire them and grind them and churn them out. So I think you'll see some separation in kinds of companies um, that do that. I think the ones that treat people better will win over time, because they'll attract, over time, better people. And there'll be reputation effects. Um, and I think the whole gig economy thing will be interesting, because what seems to be happening is people are using that not as a sole source of income, but to supplement. And that amount of autonomy and discretion is helpful. There's an interesting article recently about are companies like uh, sharing companies actually covering their cost of capital, or are they just outsourcing that and ignoring that cost, and are they viable businesses as a result? So I think TBD on that. Um, and the gig economy only ends up working if you end up with social infrastructure that supports people who buy into that economy. So eh, uh, <laughs> is my more refined answer. Um, but the good news is cognitive dissonance will force all of us to be OK with wherever it lands. <laughs> so, uh, were you next, sir? Thank you. Um, if you were working at a much smaller company, you didn't have the resource or time, and you had to perform or do a couple of things specifically for the company, uh, what exactly would you do? Um, and, and answers like, hire the right people, let's get away from that one. But if you can narrow, like, you know, really precise what you would do. So the specific things, if I were at a small company with no resources, is, um, well, if the company is hiring, um, what I would actually do is, um, Hire by commit. I do super basic stuff. I'd say, before we hire anybody, let's figure out what the job requirements are. Let's just write them down on paper. And let's have everybody interview the person. And then let's have everyone talk about it. And not what they thought or felt, but how did that person compare to what we think the job requires. That's the single biggest thing I would do. And the reason is, if you get that part right, you'll be fine on the rest. Like, if you're hiring good, capable, well-intentioned, smart people, They'll figure stuff out. You don't need to train them. You don't need to, That's the single biggest thing I would do, is focusing on making sure you get the right people kind of in the door, if you can. And just coach, and culturally, from day to day, is there anything specific? Um, I would be explicit about what you think is important. So the problem is most of us, as we become leaders and managers and what have you, we just behave the way we think we ought to behave, and we don't consciously think about how we're setting culture. Um, so if you're someone who slams doors, it's going to send a loud message, right? So um, I would ask or require or influence the leaders to be explicit about why they're doing it, just for a week. Like, have somebody keep a log of, like, here's all the things the person does, all the signals they're sending, all the ways they conduct themselves. And then at the end of the week, read that back and say, like, OK, um, what does this communicate about who we are? And is that who we want to be? And if it is, awesome. And if not, let's change it. That's what I would do. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Good evening. Let me get this to my size just a second. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about 
uh, veteran transition <coughs> initiatives. Could you please speak to Google's lessons learned about how to embrace veterans and bring them into the, to a company that would embrace them and build them up and into their future? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, Thank you. We, we do a number of things. I don't think we have anywhere close to all the answers. Um, I think um, there's a few things, though. Uh, one is there's a translation challenge. So, right, people who come out of the military, they have skills and capabilities in one way, and they're taught to talk about their stuff in a certain way, which doesn't translate. So, we try to train our recruiters and our hiring managers to understand that. And once we got to critical mass of veterans in the company, it's much, much easier. Uh, the second thing is being thoughtful about what jobs you match people with. Um, it's very often the case that it, it seems, I don't have the science on this one, it seems that if you take somebody who's a veteran and bring them into, an orga into our organization, they may be qualified for all kinds of stuff that is remarkable. Um, but the context is so incredibly different that it's almost easier to start in a place, a part of the company, where there's perhaps more structure um, or um, where the culture is a little closer. Um, and then from there, grow into the rest of the company. Um, but I think on that, it's a really difficult challenge because we turn out, as a nation, more and more veterans. Um, I mean, you know, on my wish list would be if at the end of your military service you got like six months of job training and communication, things like that. And you know, that's something companies like ours should consider providing, but I think it'd be also an amazing thing for you know, the military to provide, because um, these people do great things for us. They sacrifice a lot. We should take care of them. I have time, Amen I think, for that. one more question. Um, and I know you were all keeping track of who got in line in which order, so who was? I'm the next one. <laughs> well, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no. uh, I, you gave a great uh, number of examples for evidence-based management at yeah. Google. I was wondering, uh, and, and of course scientists have a knack of uh, writing in such a way that nobody understands what we're <laughs> saying. Uh, so uh, are you tracking science in, I assume, in computer science, and how do you track them, and how do you track like the human sciences, like Journal of Applied Psychology, would that ever uh, come across as a tracking system for you? Do you mean your question is how do we how do we keep track of what's going on in the world in the in, in academia? In terms of sci scientific findings, yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't. Let me first admit I don't think we have a plan. <laughs> I don't think um, we have a bunch of things we do. Um, one thing is, and this is true with the machine learning folks, with the data visualization folks, with the uh, site reliability engineering folks, and with people operations. Um, we read a lot and we pay attention. We, you know, we read all the journals, we read all the articles, we see a whole bunch of working papers, we just try to soak up as much as we can, number one. Number two, um, we actually have a fair amount of partnerships into academia. So part of it is things like this People Innovation Lab Summit, the Pi Lab Summit that we do. And the photo with all the faces were a bunch of our friends who had come to these you know, from academia. So creating those relationships goes a long, long way. The third is um, we have residency programs, and we actually hire full time a bunch of people. So you know, again, just in people operations, you know, a third of the people we hire have PhDs or master's degrees uh, in org psych or statistics or you know, some field that's relevant to this. And we try to keep that as an ongoing, constant conversation and relationship. Uh, and then once in a while, you see cool stuff in the popular press. Um, but it's a constant sort of sponge-like absorption process. Uh, and part of the reason PSYOP is such an amazing thing for us to be a part of and, and be involved with is because it's you know, like a focused burst of all the coolest, latest things going on. Um, and the fact that you have practitioners here and academics on the same panels comparing notes, you actually get like sort of the state of the art from both directions, even if it's like five years away from publication, even if not. And in many ways, because not everything gets published. Most things don't. This kind of conversation is almost more useful because we can actually see what people are really doing and thinking about and speculating about. And that gives us ideas. Then we can try crazy stuff. So with that, I want to thank everybody. Um, and uh, appreciate it. Uh, OK. Stay tuned. Okay. So I, I know that you will all agree with me that this was a really stimulating and in many ways a very inspiring uh, closing speech or discussion. And uh, gee, and it magically aligned with my theme track, so isn't that cool? Well, you, you did write my speech, so. <laughs> so um, I know that, that what you've been doing at Google and just the, the, what you put in your book is really inspiring to a lot of folks in, in our academic and practice world. 
but I, we believe, rumor has it, that you have some inspirational. Uh-huh. <laughs> you are inspired by. It's true. Superheroes. It's true. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, I'll come back anytime for this.